because at that point it was about multiplying my time and there's so much to do when you start a new business. Mm. Um, having the first few resources that can work fairly independently in in a state of chaos, which startups always are, yeah. um, that's really important. Thanks for joining another episode of Talks with T. I'm super excited today to have uh, Jeremy Crane on the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, really happy to be here. Uh, for those who don't know Yellow Door Energy, I'd love if you could give them a quick brief about the company. Right, well, we're a Dubai headquartered provider of clean energy solutions for businesses. Uh, we operate across uh, currently seven countries, um, servicing lots of multinationals, large regional companies, and uh, ultimately we... Our goal is to try to reduce the cost of power, make it cleaner, and make it more reliable. Amazing, amazing. And, and last year you had uh, quite a big raise in terms of uh, investment as well, so congratulations on that. Thank you, yeah. Uh, it seems like uh, just from afar, uh, sustainable energy has kind of been your, your calling. I think after you went into consulting, you, you jumped into this space. What, what drew you to get into sustainable energy? <laughs> well, it actually started even before that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I grew up uh, uh, with a strong passion for sailing, windsurfing. And, uh, and when, I was, uh, when I was in my undergrad engineering in Canada, I, uh, I had a, a, an affinity for, for things that might be related to, to what you do personally, right? Yeah. So I actually studied fluid dynamics uh, looking at, uh, there, was a, there was a study called computational fluid dynamics, and I looked at wind turbine blades, okay. trying to optimize the design. Yeah. And so actually my first, uh, my first job out of, out of undergrad was uh, helping to repower or improve the operations of an of a existing wind farm. Amazing. Um, and not coincidentally, that was right next to in a fantastic windsurfing location <laughs> in the beautiful Costa Rica. So, yeah. so I, I've been at renewables for 20 plus years. And, and what, what drew you to it and made, when did you realize this was your greater calling for the lack of a better phrase? <laughs> I, I think that, uh, <clears throat> I would say that calling is not the word I, I, <laughs> I would use for my career. Yeah. I've been extremely fortunate to have just opportunities mm. that have come forward mm. that excite me mm. and, and I take the next step and, and those, those opportunities keep reinforcing this, this renewables direction. Um, and obviously the industry's grown enormously, yeah. right? Yeah. First wind conference, I was back in the early 2000s in the US, all of the US, there was like 300 people at this conference. <laughs> you go there three years later, there's 3,000 people. Yeah. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah. That's, that's still, you know, two decades ago. So um, the industry just keeps growing and, mm -hmm. it, and it's, it's all the, the new innovation that happens there, the new business models, the new technology just keeps me excited. Um, I haven't had any desire to look elsewhere. So yeah. I think it was, it was just there and, and, and the opportunities have grown and I've been able to move around geographically, of course, and yeah. different functions within it. But uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a fun ride. Nice. You said, you know, it, it was a function of new opportunities uh, coming your way and you pursuing those opportunities. What was the first opportunity that comes to mind that really drew you and drew you into this? Well, look, I think after, uh, after that initial, uh, stint in Costa Rica, I got a, I had a, a real job. I mean, yeah. that was a job, but I, I got a job that actually paid me something yeah. reasonable. And that was, uh, but took you away from the, from the coast and the surfing. It absolutely did. Yeah. It, uh, it was, uh, to build a wind farm in Nebraska, okay. not, nowhere near water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it helped my passion for skiing, yeah. but, uh, that was, uh, that was, that was what brought me into the main stream of the business, right? Mm. It was building, it was for, a, a what we call an EPC, a mm. company that builds, um, infrastructure and, uh, and 
started developing our professional chops in that space and uh, had a fantastic um, uh, boss mentor that supported that and uh, and with that uh, that that US based company um, I actually then had a an awesome opportunity to take another step and build a full utility uh, and it was designed to be a wind diesel hybrid utility this is back again in the in a in the early 2000s when mm. that was a leading edge thing to yeah. think about <clears throat> an islanded grid with with wind and uh, and diesel and uh, so you know really being at the early edge of that working with some of the think tanks uh, at the time there's nrail and and all the stuff that they were doing across north america mm. that was um i guess got me out and trying and and a passion for being a slight a step ahead of what yeah. the mainstream was and mm. i guess i've tried to follow that uh, ever since yeah and it sounds like things were going well in in, in kind of the more established companies or corporate environment. Why did you decide to take a stab at it on your own? <laughs> um, <clears throat> look, I guess. So I, I think I think I've taken two stabs at mm. it, right? Mm. So one was um, I was a uh, I was in strategy consulting, as you mentioned, and uh, I feel that I. As, as many strategy consultants feel, there's there's something more than yeah. than helping other people with how they look at their problems. And and while that's a fun thing to do, I wanted to do something my myself, something pretty hands on. <clears throat> and that led to setting up uh, my first solar company, which was was in Canada. And it was really motivated. Um, the opportunity, the timing was motivated by regulations. Um, they bring brought in regulations that heavily subsidized the installation of solar mm. back in 2009, and uh, and we we took advantage of that and uh, did a bunch of rooftop solar pro, um, in in Canada. Um, <clears throat> regulations changed, evolved. Uh, the subsidies uh, went away, mm. and so we grew into new regions and uh, that was north northeast US that was Italy eventually Japan Jordan and uh, and through that um, uh, I ended up uh, basically coming to the Middle East uh, Jordan was a was it at its infancy in renewables development <clears throat> fantastic leadership in that um, it, by the regulators there to drive an industry that was absolutely nascent in the whole region yeah, true. Uh, at that point. And uh, um, along with a Jordanian partner, we had some early successes there <clears throat> and got to know some of the, um, you know, the key movers in the region and, uh, and, and eventually sold that business to uh, an investment group here in Dubai and, and, that's what got me here. <laughs> <laughs> um, w when I think about that experience, you know, you have up to that stage kind of really no experience uh, building a business, leading a company, exploring opportunities in new geographies. So what did you learn building version 1.0 of, of, you know, I guess the predecessor of Yellow Door? Um, look, I, I think... Uh, <clears throat> In my early career as a project manager, I got to know how to build things, right? It, it was the, the idea of organizing and structure and, and stuff was, was there and that utility I ran, I, you know, I had to set up accounting and all the other bits and pieces, yeah. but I didn't have direct skin in the game. Mm. And I think what I learned in that first, as you called it, the first uh, real business of my own, mm. um, it's called Bright Power, by the way. Yeah. I still love that it's a, name. It's, it's a good, it's a solid name. <laughs> it's a solid name. Yeah. Play uh, on words as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in the, with Bright Power, I think the one of the most important things I learned was uh, how important a founding team is, um, how important it is to find the right shareholders and investors, and the team dynamics that you build. Because at that point, it was about multiplying my time. And there's so much to do when you start a new business. Mm. Um, having the first few resources that 
can work fairly independently in in a state of chaos, which startups always are. Yeah. Um, that's really important, and I think that's that was my takeaway from that. And in fact, if you if you'd asked me a couple of years later, I was I'm never going to do that again because it, <laughs> it, it was so uh, ultimately all consuming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, and so that was it, that those those dynamics I think are what really um, stress new new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And how do you build that? So you said having a team to a large extent that can multiply your capability. How do you build that and instill that in a company? Yeah, so I think it's uh, <clears throat> it's finding a few people that you really trust, people that um, ideally complement your skill sets, um, and and that trust hopefully translates into their ability to work relatively independently. Right? You can give them a broad task, and they can go and get it done without checking back. That's what you need to be able to multiply your time. Um, and, you know, I've, I think back, if I look at, at uh, Yellow Door today, I've still got some of those fantastic individuals. Not everyone. There's always people that move on. But, uh, you know, I've got a couple of them that have, have been there from day one. I've got a few that joined me, you know, six, 12 months later mm -hmm. and uh, super proud of, of their progress as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the first time I was really aware or conscious of this idea of multiplying your time was there's a book called The Effective Executive. Um, and within the book, they talk about it's by Peter Drucker and he talks about high leverage activities. And so what types of activities can you invest your time in that have a multiplier effect that do 10x the output versus low leverage activities? and I think sometimes we do a lot of these things unconsciously and then it's only kind of looking back do we realize that actually I can label it I have an understanding of what it is so uh, I love this kind of idea of multiplying your time it makes it makes a ton ton of sense and then to a large extent your your foundation had been in in Canada how did you sniff these new opportunities in new markets what led you to pursue those opportunities? How do you evaluate whether or not going away from home base makes sense? Um, you know, that's, that's interesting. I think, um, look, I, I'm, I love Canada. It's my home. It will always be my home. Yeah. But uh, I never grew up thinking that, that the border meant anything overly significant, mm -hmm. right? Even in undergrad, I was I did some of my studies in Singapore, mm -hmm. right? First job was in Costa Rica, and then the U.S., right? So, yeah. so Canada was always, always is always there, yeah. and I'm you know very lucky that it always will be there, and I yeah. can go back whenever I want. But um, I think the I find Canada to be <clears throat> in my early years to be a little bit slow mm. people use the term provincial right yeah. you look at what you can do next door it's safe mm. it's secure mm. um and i've always chased new things right just as we talked about yeah. new technology yeah. new markets new opportunities and um and that's that's the emerging markets those are the one places that excite me <clears throat> so you know um i not somebody who brags about the number of countries I've been to, I've, but I've I've been to a lot of yeah. really random places. Yeah, uh, had a lot of interesting experiences, most of them positive. Yeah. And, uh, and you're still here to tell the story. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, where, where do you think this desire to chase new things, whether it's geographies, technologies, where, where does that come from? Ah, it's interesting. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a desire to learn, mm. um, stimulation, uh, mental stimulation. I think it's, I, I, I love having, you know, conversations like this with people who bring up new ideas and new, new areas. That's, that's what, mm. when, at the end of the day, that's what I find fulfilling. So, mm. so if I've been able to, um, <clears throat> you know, meet a, meet a tribe in, in northern Mali and, and share coffee with them, you know, 
it's like, yeah, that's mind blowing. I don't need yeah. that every day, but that's, that's yeah. really cool. Right. And so putting myself in those situations where, where, <clears throat> you know, I can be in, in Southern Jordan, having Mensif with, with the mayor of a little community mm. and, and then, you know, getting around to those different sorts of things. Those, those are what, what, those are the joys of life. Mm. And if you can weave in work yeah. and pleasure along with them, all the better. Yeah, yeah. That's the fuel in your tank to a large extent. Yeah. What's it like? Uh, how old were you when you when you exited Bright Door or Bright Energy? Um, that was in uh, what twenty twelve. So I was about uh, about thirty five. Okay. Okay. And you said that you at the stage. I guess at the stage you have. Were you married? Did you have a family? Uh, I was getting married. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so you, you alluded. The reason I ask is you alluded to the fact that, you know, it was all, it was all consuming. But I think that's what entrepreneurship is. And you said I'm never going to get back into it, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> I and did. in a circumstance where you're just getting married and building a family. Yeah, I know. I said these things a few times, right? I, I moved back to Canada when I was 30 and said, this is it. I'm staying. You know? <laughs> never say never. Never say never. No. Um, look, I've got a, I've had a, my wife has been fantastically supportive. Um, she was able to uh, change with her career and, and continue uh, very successfully here in, in the UAE as well um, at that same point. So we've, uh, we've both grown and experienced these things together. Um, look, I think the, the thing that um, uh, that I realized, well, I said I would never do it again. What I, I that morphed into, I'm never going to sit on a couch in my garage and start with nothing and a notepad, right? Yeah. I, I think I'm um, uh, I'm too impatient for that, yeah. for lack of a better word. But uh, when I when I got around to Yellow Door, it was you know, kind of put the pieces together before I jumped in, right? Had a co-investor, had a few employees lined up, not nothing finalized mm -hmm. and said, okay, you know what? There's some, in, there's some uh, rudimentary, but enough infrastructure that we can actually hit the ground and do something mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. rather than spending six months trying to get a a business like license in in Russell came out right yeah, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can yeah, yeah. you can actually do something from day one and mm. and uh maybe it's impatience um mm. maybe it's maturity but that was that was the difference um this time around okay what do you look for now you have the benefit of experience wisdom whatever you want to call it and and when you're starting yellow door what were you looking for in those early employees? How did you interview for it? How did you assess for it? Well, look, I think we talked a little bit about um, <clears throat> the ability to work independently. Mm. Um, I think beyond that, um, you need to see that somebody has the ability to, has the, has the competencies to grow, mm. right? So, you know, <clears throat> I think I hired a, a, uh, a sales engineer, right? junior person but they he, he was very uh it was clearly somebody who was going to be able to grow quickly and and you need those early team to be able to grow because every month every six months the company's doubling in size yeah and if those people aren't able to grow they get left behind and then sometimes they get disillusioned so mm. it's really great to have people that that can grow with with the business <clears throat> And how do you look for that, assess that? <laughs> um, look, I, I, I'm, I'm not a, I wouldn't, couldn't say that I'm a recruiting expert. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, if you look at somebody who's had some degree of corporate experience, they've hopefully built the fundamentals, right? Whether they've worked for a bank or, you know, a, a multinational had some of that that early training that's mm. something that's that's a good indicator um the you know just basic competency tests be it be it you know as, as a yeah. consultant yeah. i still yeah. sometimes default to, <laughs> to case studies and and those sorts of uh, yeah. logic tests um you know obviously today we're, we're a little bit more professional and we do 
you know, more uh, <clears throat> uh, psychometric testing and stuff. But uh, mm. yeah, I think it's uh, um, it's difficult to to say. But you you know, when you're hiring certain roles, that you're hiring for that particular role, mm. and that's the skill set you need. When mm. you're a startup, you're looking for somebody who's got a broad base of experience mm. and is interested in doing more. Yeah, and then yeah. you're probably have got somebody who's who's going to learn and going to grow with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In kind of the context of the principles we have at Bezat, you know, we call it hunger, and it's like that desire uh, to continuously to not be satisfied with uh, kind of the status quo or be satisfied with reaching the top of the mountain. It's like, what's next? It's sometimes that's exhausting, uh, Mm -hmm. but I think that goes a long way to have that inherently built into, into someone on the team. Yeah. Yeah. Inquisitive, right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you think about uh, building Yellow Door, what were some of the lessons you took from, uh, the first company into the second company we're like okay we're not I'm not going to do this I, I'm not going to make this mistake again look I think uh, I'll go back to to one um, very important lesson um, w- with the with the first company I jumped into a uh, partnership um, a you know an equity share with with uh, another another individual um, and <clears throat> I think, I mean, the other individual is very bright guy, very capable individual, but we didn't see the trajectory together. Mm. And, and I think, um, it's really important that you find somebody that <clears throat> not if it compliments you, of course, yeah. but, but also shares where you can see a shared vision and where you can see a division of responsibilities in the long term. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's, I was, that's really important. So actually with yellow door, I, um, I didn't end up having a co-executive. Yeah. Um, and, but what I did do is I had, um, a very engaged investor Mm. early on, Mm. um, who, who supported, guided, funded, Mm. um, a lot of our early needs. Uh, and my business is uh, in the infrastructure energy space and yeah. very capital, capital intensive. intensive yeah. So, so there's there's a lot of capital needed, and that that was a that was important for us as well. <clears throat> yeah. So I think having uh, having that, and then as we grew, um, you know, one of the things that uh, one of our sil- one of those Silicon Valley uh, talking heads yeah. uh, said, uh, yeah. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but um, is Every year you want to try to fire, hire somebody who you couldn't hire the year before. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's so true, mm. right? Every, every year you grow, you grow professionally. Mm. The company grows in its demands and needs and ability to support an executive. Mm. And so as we've grown, I've been really fortunate to find, find those executives, those, yeah. those colleagues those, that are, can now support me and in leading the business and, yeah. and we've built year by year a, a, yeah. uh, a leadership team that's uh, I think uh, you know second to none in our in our business yeah no that's awesome I like that you know every year it's to a certain extent an indication of the progress you're making right because really bright people will ask really tough questions in the interview process and they're they're assessing if they want to be a part of this journey. And so when you're able to attract really amazing people, it means that you're doing something right with the business to be able to get them excited to join the the magic carpet ride. <laughs> yes. So tell me a little bit about your journey building Yellow Door. Uh, well, look, I, I think um I've been reflecting on this uh, post the last funding round, mm. and uh, I I kind of I look at it as three phases. Okay. So we had our our startup scrappy phase, right? A lot of bootstrapping and seed investors, and um, you know, trying to go into new markets, trying to get our first product delivered, all of those uh, those those fun things, um, <clears throat> and 
uh, you know, 2015, 2017, third period was, was that. Um, in 2017, 2018, we, we'd gotten to a, a, a small scale, but a, a scale where we kind of had a going organization. Mm. Maybe we were 30 people. And, uh, and we, I think we made the first major change, which was from an organization which was pretty much focused on you know, me as the founder and, and having to be able to pretty much touch everything that was going on in the business to a business that was you know, two strong offices in Jordan and UAE and starting to create functions that supported those. And we restructured into functional um, geographical mm. uh, ways of doing things. And, and that was a good leap forward for us. That was an ability to, to, to scale. And, and that led us into um, our, what we call our Series A round, where we brought in some institutional investors, raised mm. 65 million, that grew to 100. Um, and and that, was, that, that brought us into that second phase of, of scale up. Mm. Right, went mm. from startup to scale up, yeah, and uh, you know, sort of twenty nine to 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 last year twenty two was that that scaling up period, right, mm. where we were putting in place all of those more sophisticated systems. You know, you implement an RMP, ERP, yeah. you you map out all your business processes, and yeah. and certainly that's not all done yet, but yeah. it's it's getting better. Getting, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm quite proud of what what's happened there, and. And now we're into the next phase, that that solid growth phase, where we can build on these the, the pillars of our business, mm. and I think really multiply the effect that that we're having. Right, mm. just as I talked about multiplying your effect from day one, yeah. I now same thing. You still think, how am I multiplying mm. every hour of my day to mm. provide more productivity for the business mm. and, the, and the team around me? Mm. It's just it's a bit of a different scope as opposed to <laughs> yeah. only having impact on a couple of people. Now you have, can have impact on tens or twenties of people. So. Yeah. And how, how have you had to evolve as a leader through this period? Well, that's great. So look, I think um, <clears throat> you know one of one of those organizational theory things that everyone um, points to is that that kind of magic line around 72, right? When you've got a business below that size or an organization below that size, yeah. you can know everyone. Mm -hmm. When you have an organization above that size, mm -hmm. I guess whatever our, our mental mental limitations or, or mine certainly, I can't know everyone personally. I can know their names, yeah. I can know what they do, yeah. but having a personal relationship is not there. And if you don't have a personal relationship, mm -hmm. the way that you influence and motivate somebody is different. And so what I've had to do is be able to um, find ways and systems where I can deliver a message that that everybody can organize, understand the organization from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also rely on my my direct reports to reinforce, adapt for their teams that message. Mm. And so a lot of my time has been gone from being able to directly personally influence people to driving influence or direction or whatever you want to call it mm. across a, a, an organization. Um, <clears throat> that's one thing. I think the other is being much better at um, writing down documenting plans, mm. right? It's tied into the first, but it's easy when you've got 30 people and you know what you want to do to tell people what they need to do. Mm. As you get larger, you have to really be very good at um, <clears throat> setting the big goals, breaking them down for everybody so that they can they can move them forward on their own. Mm. And, and that delegation of thought and um, through goals I think is really important as you mm. as you get a little bit bigger yeah 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 no I think this influencing at scale uh, makes you know I had never heard it in the context of 72 but I think completely completely agree with you there what have you done that has helped you execute influencing at scale <laughs> Well, I mean, no rocket science, mm. right? Uh, I think we've, uh, we know, we have all hands meetings mm. once a month. Mm. Um, we have a, um, you know, a very, uh, a system of, of goal setting 
um, performance objectives and regular monitoring of those, mm. which which help um, then track the input. Yeah. Um, we do employee surveys, uh, you know, employee net promoter scores yeah. to, to understand how people are receiving it. Um, so I think it's just a different way of forming groups um, and champions within each group mm. that can drive that. Mm. Um, I'm using the word champion a lot, <laughs> right? We've got a, we've got a ESG is a big, big part of our, of our business. Yeah. We're, obviously we're a sustainable business, but we also have to, we, we, we do sustainability for others. Yeah. We also want to be sustainable, mm, right? Mm. So I've had sustainability champions. Mm. How do I pull those together under and, and make that one of our goals? Mm. Um, it's been, been interesting. Yeah. Um, and then it's reporting, right? Mm, it's mm. getting, getting the data back. And, and taking actions as quickly as possible to stay agile despite the scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you have kind of the added complexity of being in multiple geographies to, with multiple cultures uh, as well. So, so I can only imagine kind of the challenge you have to, you have to uh, overcome on that front. Uh, tell me a little bit about the fundraising process. I mean, you, you've... Uh, you, you mentioned it's a capital intensive business, uh, but you've also been very successful at uh, getting investors on board who are willing to, you know, put money where their mouth is in terms of funding that expansion. What have you learned about fundraising along the way? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, fundraising is something that's, part of every entrepreneur's journey. Um, I shouldn't say everyone. I'm jealous of those who seem to get by without. Yeah, themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous too. I would say in, <laughs> in, in, in the next, uh, in the next iteration, I'm going to try to do no fundraising, but some businesses just don't allow for that. All the power, um, all the power to you for that. I, I, yeah. I've said the same thing, <laughs> um, but you know what? It does come with a lot of benefits yeah. beyond the capital, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think one of the things that I've learned about fundraising is that you need to be agile, right? Mm. Every time you have a conversation with somebody, mm. you get feedback. Mm. And and if you're not getting feedback, you're not listening well enough or you're not talking to, to mm. a good person. Mm. Um, and then you need to adapt and mm. you need to evolve and you need to figure out, okay, is that message something which is unique to that individual, yeah. which I need to, uh, you know, if it's a negative message, I need to avoid those sorts of individuals no. or is it something which I can actually use to improve what I do mm. and I'd say the number of times I've had conversations with investors positive or negative but received any sort of criticism or feedback and have been able to take that internally and make an adaptation is mm. it's enormous yeah so I do think that fundraising process <clears throat> however time-consuming it can be can also make you make your business better make you better Mm. Um, and so I think that's one bright side of it. Yeah. Um, as far as, uh, you know, magic bullet for someone who's trying to fundraise right now, I, I mean, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I, I, there, there's lots of books on that. Yeah. I, I yeah. think, uh, I, I was talking to one group a couple, a couple weeks ago who was raising some money and, you know, I had a classic feedback to them was, I don't think this is going to scale. Yeah. It requires a network effect. I don't yeah. think you're going to get there. But hey, if you do, brilliant. Yeah, you know, yeah. you prove me wrong. Yeah. Right? Go and do it. And yeah. I, I, but it's uh, yeah, I think it's a, um, it's an art which is very difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. how, how do you organize your time? How do you? I mean, we're not. Uh, we haven't had many interactions, but I get the perception could be right or wrong that you're very structured, organized with your time, and so. Um, how do you go about thinking about how you spend your time uh, on a personal level and then on a professional level? You know, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the compliment that I'm, <laughs> that I'm structured. Um, perhaps sometimes I am. Um, look, I think it's, uh, I, I, I use the word priorities mm. all the time, right? Mm. What is, what is my priority mm. and, and broader life, right? I've got, I've got a young family that's, that, it means the world to me and, mm. and that's a priority mm. business success and business is a priority to me and, and health personal health activities related to that is, is priority so 
I try to balance those mm. and I would, I'd say that nine times out of 10, they're not in balance, Yeah, <laughs> but I'm always, always talking about it. I was trying to, to work on it. And at least thinking <clears throat> about it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, and, and so I sort of, I've set time bounds for when I, when I'm on in work and when mm. I'm off. Yeah. Um, and then I, I need to, but and then I also have to have relief times, right? Mm. So, so for me, I'm typically on from somewhere around eight thirty to nine until about seven, mm. right? Mm. Changes day to day slightly, but mm. that I'm working during that time. Mm. Mm. I don't do social lunches. I yeah. don't do other things, uh, but I, I, I'm working. Um, and then I've got a time for kids and family, and then. If I need to, I can maybe do some more stuff in evenings, but I, I try to avoid that. Yeah. Um, and and then I have my reliefs, right? Okay, right now, it's really important I get some time for sports, so yeah. I'm going to go and do that. Mm. Um, and and then you just, you know, you, you, you balance it. Um, of late, I've been working with, I've had a, I have a had an assistant that helps with me, mm. with, me with my scheduling. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that I rely on somebody else to allocate my time. Mm. I don't. Mm. But having somebody who can um, monitor your calendar and say, oh, you've got a conflict or somebody's asked for a meeting later today, you probably won't see that yeah. because I don't read my emails yeah. Yeah. every hour. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a once a day, maybe twice a day type of guy. So those are some of the things that I don't know that, that I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm certainly not at a, a 10 out of 10 on that uh, yeah. agenda and that side of the organization. Yeah. I, I mean, I think having that priority framework resonates with me. I think if, at least if I have that, I can always be thinking about, I'm conscious that I'm out of whack at times and I can say, okay, it's time to, to readjust. Um, yes. I try not to beat myself up about being out of whack, uh, but but at least having that mental framework around here's ideally how I want to spend my time mm -hmm. helps me at least have a North Star in terms of where where ideally I should I should be I should be going. Yes. How do you think about kind of this new phase? You said you know you're in phase three now. What is what does Jeremy look like as a leader in phase three? What does the company look like in phase three? Yeah, look, I think three, phase three for us is um, is building a more professional, um, lower risk um, um, company that needs to maintain its agility and its pace of growth. Um, and I, I, I contrast those two because I think as you put in stronger systems and processes, sometimes you lose agility. No. And and so my focus is trying to achieve both. Mm. Trying to, you know, I, I sent one of my country directors a, a ninety step process yesterday. Yeah. And uh, we'll see how he <laughs> how he manages that and digests that. He loves processes, yeah. but but is that right? Yeah. I think a lot of my time over the next few years to this phase of, of company growth is going to be taking processes like that and trying mm. to streamline them, mm. um, trying to figure out how we, we optimize it for faster flow through mm. of what we do, right? In our business, we find a, a solar opportunity mm. and then it needs to move through many stages, have a lot of checks along the way. How do we automate some of those? Mm. Um, and, um, you know, last year it was, how do we measure that time? Mm. Now we're measuring. So we've got a benchmark now. Now we can start chipping away at it and try to make it faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I heard you say uh, a couple of things today. Uh, I heard you kind of talk about influencing at scale once you you reach a specific point and being intentional and conscious about about how you do it. This idea of being agile and actually being a good listener uh, in the fundraising process can add a ton of value to your to your company. Uh, I like this idea of weaving in happy moments uh, into the work work you do as kind of fuel for for the engine. Um, I love this idea of every year hiring somebody you couldn't hire the year before as as a external benchmark on on how you're doing in terms of growing the organization. Uh, I've had a, a 
a lot of fun having this conversation. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing your 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 thoughts. Well, thank you. No, it was fantastic uh, to hear somebody think I was uh, intelligent in a few points there. So <laughs> it'll sound like the great, great recap. I appreciate that. And it's been wonderful uh, having this uh, this conversation. Thanks a ton.